Welcome back to this lecture where we're going to continue on and we're going to have some practical use cases for for loops. So for this lecture, we're going to start off with a very similar project where it generates an array and this time we're going with the incrementation. So we're starting at zero and then we are adding one. So here is our for loop, our incrementing for loop that will push values into the array. But now let's say I have a different scenario and I'm gonna rewrite this for loop right here again so that we have this stuck in our minds. But this scenario is that I am fetching data from the server. So this array is not going to be empty and we're not going to push data to the array. What we are gonna do is fetch data from the array. Now I may not know how many elements are in my array. There could be three elements in the array, for example, three strings in the array, or there could be 30,000 strings in the array or numbers or whatever primitive data or other types of data that are in my array. This is where for loops come in. If I don't know how many elements are in the array, I have to dynamically tell the for loop, go get all the elements in the array and I want you to iterate, go one by one by one, through the array and print out each element of the array. So let's create an array with three elements. I'm gonna say, hello world, and let's have the number 200. So we have three elements in our array, and I want to print out each element. And next up, what I want to do is define the counter, condition, and iteration of the for loop. So let's create that counter, which is just simply a variable that stores a number that tells us how many times the execution context of the for loop has been invoked. So at the moment, it's zero. Next up, we have the condition. Counter, condition, iteration. Always think about that when defining a for loop. So we're starting at zero, and don't forget, the access of an index is zero base. So we have hello, that's zero world is one and 200 is two. So now I want to say I is less than, and now I have an array, but I dynamically filled this array. Now I know how many elements are in this array, but I'm talking about a scenario where you dynamically fetch data and populate the array or add elements to the array. But I don't know how many elements have been added to the array, let's say. Well, in that case, we need to get the array's length. We need to count how many elements are in the array. And as you know, arrays come with the length property that tells you how many elements are within that array. So I'm just gonna say array. So I'm targeting this variable, which contains this array. And then I'm gonna say dot length. That will tell me there are three elements in the array. And don't forget, length is not zero base. So it won't return the number two, as in zero, one, two. It will return the number three, as in one, two, and three. So it's not zero indexed in terms of getting the length. The length will actually tell you how many elements are in the array, and that will return the number three in this case. Then I'm gonna add in an ending semicolon, and now I want to increment. So now comes the iteration. I've done the counter, the condition, and then you have the iteration. Now with the iteration, again, you have two choices. You're either going to increment or de-increment. In my case, I'm starting from zero, and then I want to go up from there. So I increment, and that's why I have the I is less than. So we're checking to see if this number is less than the amount of elements in the array. And then we want to keep adding one each time we execute the for loops execution context. And then as we keep adding one, adding one, adding one, eventually this condition will fail. Now what I want to do is target the console and log out a value to the console, and we're gonna target the array. And in this square brackets, I want to use my counters value, which starts at zero, and then it will go up from there. So let's see what happens with this. So again, I'm just targeting that array, that box that contains our array, 
and then within the square brackets you could either type a number so 0 1 2 but in this instance I want to dynamically fetch the data so we start at 0 and it goes up from there let's go ahead and find out the result in the console there we go we have each element within the array printed out individually it's no longer one giant array we have one string hello one string world and also one number which is 200. So what actually happened behind the scenes? Well let's take a look at this. Now don't forget my array is being created right here. So the JIT compiler goes to the first line, it creates a variable, gives that variable a name. So it's a box, it gives the box a name and the box is storing an array. And that array has three elements in it. But don't forget I may not know how many elements are in this array. But however in this case we have three elements in the array. Now, this array has been created, nothing's happened so far. However, when we get to the for loop, the JIT compiler says, ah, there's a loop here, and we have an execution context that this programmer wants us to keep looping through. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. I have a variable, so what it does is it immediately creates a variable with the name you've given it. It doesn't have to be I, it could be any name you wanted, but in my case, I'm saying I for index. It creates that box and that box simply stores a number. Now, after that, it says, okay, what is the condition for this execution context to run? Well, is I less than array.length? So what it does here is it says, right, I need to go fetch the variable array, which it does and then pull out the length property because we're working with an array. So pull out the length property and this property is dynamically generated. So what it'll do is it will give me the value in this case of three because don't forget length is on the one index. So this is one, two, and three. There are three items in the array. Now again, the beauty of it is that this is dynamic, meaning let's say I fetched in thousands of pieces of data and stored them in this array. Well, then array.length would give me however many elements are in the array. I don't need to know how many elements are in the array. I can just call this property once the array has been populated, once it's received all of the values from the database and whatnot, I can say array.length and that will tell JavaScript how many elements are in this array. So then we can start iterating through the array, meaning we go one element by one element by one element and so forth. Iteration is one by one by one. So this, in this case, array.length will give us the number three. That's all it's doing, it's just returning a number. And finally, we need to say, what is our iteration? Is it incrementing or de-incrementing? Very important because if we don't do this, our conditional statement as long as we've programmed it properly, will fail at some point. If we don't increment, it won't fail. And therefore, we will have a huge memory issue and it will crash the browser. So as we're incrementing up, eventually, I will be equal to three, and therefore, it is not less than three. So this condition will be false and everything will stop executing. Now on the first run, the first execution of this context, we grab the console window and we tell it to log out a value. So we're targeting this window right here in the browser. And then we say, go grab the box array. Now again, you could give this variable any name you wanted, but I'm being very literal here. So I'm saying to JavaScript, go grab the variable array. And then don't forget an array is an object and the way you can access objects properties is by using the square brackets. And especially if those property names are numbers, so 0, 1, 2 and so forth. And that's how you access elements in your array. Now we have i here, so we're using this variable, this counter within our execution context. So I can say i, which on the first run it's equal to zero. So i is equal to zero on the first run. What does that mean? It means we pull out the first element in the array, which produces the string hello. Now what happens when we're finished executing? What does it do? Well, it does the iteration. It does the i++. 
it knows that this execution context will want to be repeated multiple times. And now the variable has been iterated, meaning we added one in this instance. So we added one. Is i less than three? Is one less than three? Yes. Execute. Again, we grab the console window and don't forget we have i here, but now the value of i has changed when we run this context. i is equal to one now, so this is one. So it will go and grab that array and then it will grab the element with the index of one, which this is zero, one. So that produced a string world. Now finally, what happens is it iterates through, it's finished again, and we do i++ right here, i++. And JavaScript does that automatically because it goes back up and i is now equal to two. Is two less than three? Yes. Execute the context. Target the console window, log a value out, go grab the array and now i is equal to two. So we just say i right there, but really it's producing the value two this time. And as you know, the element within that array with the index of two is 200, zero, one, two. It's as simple as that. Now, when it runs, it runs one last time, it says i++, plus plus, so it adds one onto the variable i. i is now equal to three. Is three less than three? No, this is false. Don't execute. Done. It's finished. So that's exactly what happened. It just went through 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and then it stopped. That's all it did. So hopefully now you can kind of see what's been happening behind the scenes. So if I change that back, let's say I array.length. There we go. And hopefully now you can see why array.length has the one index. We start at zero, we use the counter at zero, and this dot length has a one index. So it starts at one, one, two, three. And with i having that offset is zero, one, two. It makes sense. And this allows us to iterate through our arrays very easily. And this is why we don't really have to understand how much data we are trying to read because it's all dynamic, partly due to fetching of the array's length. And so if I had, let's say, more values, well, now we have four values in this array. So array.length will produce the value of four. Then we start at zero and we access the zero element. Is that less than the array length? Yes. Then we go to one, two, and three, and three will run because that means that i, which is now equal to three, which is targeting this element in the array, is less than the array length. And then once it iterates through one more time, i will become four, and four is not less than four, so we simply stop right there. We stop iterating through those elements in the array. So that's nice and easy, but let's take a look at another practical example. I'm going to show you something really nice that you can use in JavaScript and it will allow you to iterate through keys within an object. So first of all, I am going to create an object. So I'm going to create a variable called obj. It's just a box that contains a value. And in this case, it contains a load of little boxes. Don't forget. And each one of those little boxes has a key and you need to get that key to unlock that mini box. So we have three keys right here, color, width, and height. Now, if I was pulling in this data dynamically, let's say I may not know how many keys this object has. So what I need to do is find a way of iterating through each one of those properties within my object. How would I go about doing this? So I'm gonna create another variable and I'm going to give it the very literal name of array. Now, you don't have to call it array. You could give it whatever name you'd like, of course, because it's just a box. So it's just there for storage. And now I'm going to say assign the value that is returned from object.keys. 
So what does this mean? Well, object, first of all, must be spelled with a capital O, and this allows me access to the object constructor. And then we have the keys method. So what this will allow me to do is pass in an object. So object with a capital O dot keys, and then I pass in the object I want to read the keys from. So in this case, we're targeting this variable, which contains this object. And I'll comment out this for loop, and then hit refresh. So we have obj, which is the object, and then we have array, which is our array of strings. So you'll notice what object.keys did was it said, okay, go grab me that object. So now it opened that box up, it had a look at that object, and it said, right, we need to read the key name. So we have color, width, and height. Those are the key names within this object. Notice what it did. It took the names of the properties, the keys, and it produced them as strings. So color, width, and height. So now we have the key names. Now, if we just iterate through this array, we'll get each key name individually. So if I bring back this for loop, what it will ultimately do is log out to the console an element within the array, so 0, 1, 2, which will be color, width, and height. Don't forget, array just contains these strings now, color, width, and height. So when I access the array, and say, go grab me, let's say, out of this array, the element with the index of zero, that's on the first run, on the first execution of this for loop, i is going to be zero. So it will produce color in the console window, and then it'll just carry on like that. So let's see if this works. I'm just going to hit refresh, and there we go, color, width, and height. But how do we access the property values? Well, the simple answer is to target the object and add in some outer square brackets. So we know that this right here is producing a string. We're targeting that array, which that array contains a load of strings, which is our keys. And then it will produce something like color on the first run when i is equal to zero. So it'll access the zero element in the array and you'll pull out the color property of this object. So if we go ahead and save it and hit refresh, now we get the values of our properties. So just to clarify this code, we have our object, then we have a second variable, which when object.keys is executed, it targets the object and it reads the keys out. Each key name will be a string in our array. Once we have this, our for loop will execute. We have our counter, which begins at zero is zero less than the array.length, which we know array.length will produce the value of three. Well, this statement is currently true and therefore the execution context will be executed. We simply then target the console window, we target our object, and then within the square brackets, we need to provide the key name. Now in this case, we are dynamically fetching the key name by targeting the array of strings. And then we're grabbing the counter, which is i, and its value will then produce a key name. So zero will produce the key name of color. And on the first execution context, you will find you will get the string red. Next, i is incremented, and now i is one. Is i less than the array length? True. And then we want to again run it, and i is now equal to one, which will pull out the second element in our array which is the width string, and that will produce the value stored within the width property of our object. And likewise, it iterates through again and does height, and then it stops because i is incremented, and i is now equal to three, not less than three, and therefore the for loop will stop executing its context.